Tonight, um, I'm delighted to be here. Most of you probably didn't know that there's a center for medieval Renaissance studies in the desert. It's kind of a weird place to have one, but it is a organized research unit established by the Arizona Board of Regents in 1980. And uh, our mission is to promote the study of the Middle Ages and Renaissance in Arizona and, and throughout the world. We are a publisher. We publish about 30, bu 30 books. I wish it were bucks, but it was, it's books. Um, 30 books a year, two, three journals. We have an annual conference, um, which takes place next week, actually this year. And we have over 170 people coming from all over the world. We have a, a summer program at Oxford University. It was at University of Cambridge for 17 years. And we have a number of, of other programs that would be of interest to the general community as well. Um, one of my interests since becoming the director of, of the center has been the, the global Middle Ages and Renaissance. And, and a number of years ago, when we hosted a meeting of the Medieval Academy of America, we had special sessions on medieval, the medieval Southwest. Um, and then we've been trying to get a, a grant proposal funded for a number of years called Medieval and Renaissance Excursions for Kids. And this, this is a program that um, I developed. This was never funded, unfortunately. Good ideas sometimes are not funded. Uh, bad ideas sometimes are not funded, too. Uh, but I think this is a good idea that hasn't been funded. It, it's basically focused on at-risk children um, who are alienated from everything, including their, their family, their heritage, the University, uh, Arizona, everything like that. And we were going to take them to period sites throughout the state, take them to lunch, take them to the university, try to give them a, a good sense of what the university can do for them. It's, it's not as alien and intimidating as they think and give them a, a good feeling of, about their own heritage in the state of Arizona. Well, I'm glad now that we're actually in the community talking about something between the Middle Ages and the present here in Arizona, um, namely the colonial period. And Dr. Sharona Frederick, the assistant director, is a specialist in, in Latin America. Um, she worked for over 15 years in Middle Eastern and Latin American ethnography and literature, specializing in Mayan and Andean literature. Uh, she's taught at the University of Mexico. She's taught in Jerusalem. Um, and she knows a lot of stuff that <laughs> she will impart to you today. Sharona? Thank you very much. Welcome to all of you. Um, thank you very much, Bob, for that beautiful introduction. Thank you very much, Dan and Josh, for having us at the museum. Thank you very much to my colleague, Kendra Brunig in the back, who takes care of all our outreach and everything technical and logistic. And also, thank you very much to our wonderful partners from the School of Transborder Studies, um, who are with us on this event. And, and they are another wonderful part of the of, uh, ASU. You also might not know exists, but welcome to know it. And they have provided us not only with a lot of the inspiration for this program, but also with some extraordinary colonial maps that you're going to see uh, during the course of this presentation. So thank you very much to our friends from the School of Transborder Studies. Uh, and may I also say to all of you, if any of you are on campus, after you come up and visit us in ACMRS, please walk over to STS, to the School of Transborder Studies, where you can see a superb map exhibit that really connects with what my boss Bob just told you about getting people to understand the tremendous uh, cultural heritage of this area, and in this case I have to say it's one of the most extraordinary collections of colonial maps of the Southwest and uh, the Americas that I've ever seen. So now you have two reasons to come and visit the university. Welcome to you all. Let's start, since we're talking about maps, with erroneous perceptions of geography. And let's begin, now this map should be making you laugh, and, and uh, let me say this is not a map from Transborders Collection. 
this is um, something which, when my colleague Kendra showed it to me, I thought, well, this is utterly insane. Let's make this the first slide. Why? Because if we talk about Tempe and uh, what, what would later be Phoenix <clears throat> during the colonial period, if I even tell people, uh, you know, there's a tremendous amount of history here. There's actually at least 3,000 years of recorded archaeological history, maybe more. The response I usually get is, what? No. But yes, because it, take a look at this map which shows you a rather skewed vision of the world. Already from the 18th century, you'll notice that California has become something akin to the island of Java floating in the Pacific Ocean. Do you see that? Um, Arizona is rather smushed into the other southwestern states. Latin America has gone through a particularly hard time. Uh, Colombia, has, Colombia has actually been bitten out of it. And we show this to you because we want you to understand, as I'm sure you do or you wouldn't be here, maps are porous things. They're things with holes in them. They change as conceptions of history change. So take a look um, at our first slide and notice that we begin with Pima territory because of course we cannot talk about the history of uh, Arizona and specifically the area where we are now where the Pima and the Holocam uh, were and also where their descendants are without mentioning that back, let's, let's start in the Middle Ages when my center begins. Um, in the 12th century, a great network of canals crisscrossed this place. Some of the most... Um, sophisticated methods of farming in very unfarmable territory were already created by Hohokam Indians in the 12th century. By the time you get to the 17th century and the population is both Native American and Spanish mestizo, the term mestizo of course referring to the mixture of those from Spain and those Native Americans, and we'll also add into that mix um, many people of African descent, the name of the place is San Pedro. Just by a show of hands, how many of you know that? That what is now called Tempe used to be called San Pedro. Okay, a few, well now you all know. Okay, so when they say San Pedro meets you at the gates of heaven, you know you're going back to Tempe. <laughs> so boundaries change, and our conceptions of what is eternal in terms of countries and history is a changing thing. Where does the name of Sonora come from? Well, the Opata Indians, who are an important ethnic group on uh, what is now the border with Mexico, and you can also ask our friends from the School of Transborder Studies how porous and changing that border is. The Opata Indian people have a special word for corn. Are you all familiar that corn is one of the staples of Native American society, particularly here in the Southwest? We speak of the three holy sisters in Native American tradition. What are they, corn, beans? This is a cool audience, I like you, yes. Corns, be corn, beans, and squash. And the corn mother is a very important um, spirit. I don't want to say deity, let's say spirit. Um, because she's supposed to be a representation of the overall deity for many of the native peoples of the area. The, the word sonota in, Opata, in the Opata Indian language means corn. And of course, when later Spanish conquistadors heard it, they, you know, you hear things according to the morphemes, the uh, word blocks in your language, and so sonota became sonora. And so on the first Spanish colonial maps, this was Sonora. You know, that's also an important province in Mexico, of course. Um, so we have what we call fluid reference points because the reference points change. Now, one of the spurs to colonizing what you now call Arizona, all right, uh, another word taken originally from Spanish, la zona arida, the dry zone, before it's called Arizona, and later Arizona, and, and whatever other accent it will be said in, they're all legitimate. It was California, which was the spur for exploration and colonization. Now, if you look at this map, you must think this is a rather weird representation of our West here. Because California, the name is not a Native American name. The name comes from a very early 16th century Spanish knightly romance called Las Sergas de Esplandian, the great actions of the knight Esplandian. 
in which there was a magical island called California, where Esplandian was brought up on that island only by women. He was in a rather bad mood when his father, Amadis de Gaula, decided to take him off. But that magical island floating in the sea, similar to islands from other medieval European legends, have any of you heard of the Isle of Avalon, right, in the Arthurian legends? California was supposed to be this magical island floating in the sea. Now, when Hernán Cortés, how many of you have heard that name? Yeah, well, he's kind of notorious. We're gonna, his ghost is going to come back tonight. As well, well, almost, as will the ghost of the woman that he loved and then trashed and then entreated to join him again and then she trashed him. The Malinche, you're going to see they both come back into the conquest of this territory. When Cortes, after he conquered the Aztecs in Tenochtitlan, later went on other expeditions of conquest and colonization. Um, you know, there's a place called Mar de Cortes. Are you familiar with that? The Sea of Cortes. It's because, well, the old conquistadors sailed in it. And he was convinced that California was an island. Now, Cortes was a kind of an arbitrary fellow, and if he didn't like what you were saying, basically he would blow your head off. So when he had all of the men on his expedition swear that California was an island, what do you think they said? See, Capitan. Okay, and that is why California, for literally, more than two centuries after Cortes um, comes upon it, let's not say discover it, because we all know that uh, many, many different Native American groups were there for at least 10,000 years before he shows up. That's why it's pictured as an island. So that's the strange place of California. So why does that make people want to see what is slightly to the east of California? Here's why. Because when they met the Indians of California, those Indians told them that Indians slightly to the east were trading amazing things with them. They were trading a brown substance that they sweetened with honey that caused you to fall in love. Do you know what that is? We all eat too much of it. Chocolate which was actually coming up in trade routes from Central America, from the Mayan area, the Aztec Indians, or the actual name of those Indians is the Mexica people, from which the word Mexico comes. They had also appropriated chocolate, and chocolate was in the Southwest. So who here has a chocolate addiction besides myself? Thank you, women, be proud. Yes, I see a man there, be even prouder. Um, chocolate was in the Southwest, and we know that very well from the archaeological finds in a magnificent place in our next-door neighbor, New Mexico. That place is called Chaco Canyon. And one of the great medieval Native American civilizations of the Southwest in Chaco Canyon was trading with the Maya, down in Central America, and that has been absolutely substantiated without a shadow of a doubt by the American Archaeological Association. Two years ago, there are entire earthenware pots in Chaco Canyon that are filled with residue from chocolate from the 12th century. Is that amazing? Okay, Cortes hears about the chocolate and he likes the chocolate, and I hate to say it's because of Hernán Cortes that a lot of us are drinking chocolate, but I like to pin it back to an earlier period, so it goes back to the Mayan Indians, but the native people of the Southwest went, went mad about chocolate, as later would the Spanish and everybody else. So Cortes is intrigued, and he wants to explore this place. Now we're in the year 1536, and another explorer turns up, and his name is Cabeta de Vaca. How many of you know any Spanish at all? Yes, raise your hand. What does Cabeta de Vaca mean in Spanish? Head of a cow, indeed. And he had split off from another expedition that had begun in La Florida, what we today call Florida, and it's also La Florida, and he literally walked his way across the eastern the southeastern United States into the west, and he got into what was then northern Mexico, what we now call the American Southwest. Again, borders are porous. Okay, there was a time in the 19th century, do you all know that this, almost this entire area belonged to France? Do you know that? Mexico almost fell to France, and with Mexico, this area, which was part of Mexico, so we might all be speaking en français, and it's liberal babbling at each other in English and Spanish. So, Cabeza de Vaca invented crazy stories. He had to invent crazy stories because he had to justify the fact that he had split off or possibly deserted uh, or was shipwrecked. It was never quite clear from an earlier expedition. And so he told wild stories of, do you see it there? The Seven Cities of Cibola. 
Now this was a, an absolutely mad invention. Um, dating back to an earlier, would you believe, Irish legend, those of you who have heard me lecture know that I often bring the Irish into things. Um, in other lectures we can talk about the Celtic presence, but there was an Irish legend which stuck, which is that there were seven golden cities that had been discovered in the lands of the West, the Irish called them in Gaelic Tir na Og, and that those seven cities had been founded by Saint Brendan, or as we know him in Spanish, San Borondon. And Cabeza de Vaca was sure that the location for those seven cities was in between what you now know of as um, the San Pedro River, Hmm? Excuse me, not in between, to the north of what you now know of as the San Pedro River. Did he have any proof of that? None whatsoever, but it definitely interested the vice regent of Mexico, Antonio de Mendoza. And so Antonio de Mendoza talks to, well, Hernán Cortés, you had to talk to Cortés, because Cortés, of course, is the conquistador por excelente, as we say in Spanish. He's the ultimate conquistador, very nasty human being. Very nasty to both Spaniards and Indians, and dare I add, uh, people of African descent alike. He was a brutal man. And the conquest of Mexico was done brutally. And after he finished his carnage in Tenochtitlan, he declares himself Marques del Valle, right? The Marquis of the Mexican Valley. And so he obviously expected himself He's kind of the de facto ruler of Mexico until the king of Spain, Carlos V, got a little bit worried at Cortes's um, hubris and sent somebody else to be viceroy. But Cortes still expected himself to be included on every possible expedition of, of colonization and or discovery. So as you see, he was furious when he was shut out of what is going to be the expedition to find the seven cities of Cibola. You, you couldn't do this to him. He'd been kind of a god, right? The white god of the new world, as he liked to style himself. But guess what? Nobody will muck you over like your own, eh? Hey? Right? We all know that. So Cortez's worst problems at the end do not come from the Mexica Indians. They're going to come from other Spanish politicians who are upset and jealous and afraid of his rather unilateral way of wielding power. So he's excluded from this expedition. And then we get Francisco Vázquez de Coronado. And Coronado is always considered the failed conquistador of Arizona. Now he is a failed conquistador, but I have a bit of better news for you because although he failed as a conquistador, the story that, that I'm going to tell you is a kind of inspiring one, not due to Coronado, but due to some very, very courageous Spaniards in his party who actually opposed what would be his horrible mistreatment of the Native American population. That may be the part of the story you don't know. Before we continue on with Coronado, may I ask, who here is native to either uh, Arizona or New Mexico? Not a lot. Okay, there's Macaulay Kendra. I put that half up in the right How many of you, those of you who are native to Arizona and New Mexico, ever learned about Coronado in school? One, two, three. Okay, so what is that telling us? It's telling us that an entire very important block of your history you're not learning. Because this is your history. And you do not have to be Hispanic or Native American to learn it. I am a Sephardic Jew. George Washington was not a Spanish Jew. That's what I am. But George Washington is part of my history as an American, is he not? If you're living in Arizona or New Mexico, this is part of your history. But what this proves, sadly, is that history is often only begun in the 19th century. Okay? And this is one of many reasons why my director, Professor Robert Burek, insists, and he's right. It goes back to the early Middle Ages, folks. Let's not forget this older history, because this is your history, too. And I think you may become very proud of this history, because actually, one of the earliest struggles for human rights begins here. So now let's go back to Coronado, who none of you learned about. Coronado <laughs> comes, he's born in Spain. 
He hears the incredible stories of Cortes' success when Tenochtitlan, the Aztec capital, fell in 1521. Gold and silver start pouring into Spain in a way that Spain could only dream of. And Coronado is very inspired. He's 25 when he comes to Mexico. At that point, Cortes is running the show. That's in 1525, <coughs> which, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> yeah, that's in 1525, um, which make Coronado at the beginning a kind of flunky, hanger-on, fan of Cortes, um, but then he becomes his nemesis. He becomes one of the worst enemies Cortes would have. You know why? Because he's a younger version of Hernán Cortes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is there anybody here from Brazil? One Brazilian here? If you were, you'd know a very silly soap opera from Brazil called The Clone, which talks about everybody's worst nightmare. What's everyone's worst nightmare? Come on. Meeting a younger version of yourself. <laughs> God save you. And Coronado was a younger version of Hernán Cortés. He was Machiavellian. He was Ma Machiavellian. There's a term. I'm, I'm using that term from the early modern period, which is the colonial period. Let me give you those years. They're not hard at all. They begin with one notorious event, the expulsion of the Jews from Spain, 1492 followed by the defeat of the Moors in Spain, also 1492, actually the defeat of the Moors happens earlier, followed by Cristobal Colón, what, what do you know him as? Christopher Columbus, or Cristoforo Colombo, it might have been Colombo, it might have been Colón, it sure as heck was not Columbus. His trip um, to what we, we would later call the New World, this very old New World, all in 1492. That is generally put as the beginning of the early modern period, what is sometimes called the Renaissance, except, ouch, if you were poor, or uh, Native American, or black, or mestizo, or Jewish, or Irish, or anything, and just poor, it wasn't the Renaissance. It was a great Renaissance in Italy of art, but I'm going to refer to it as the early modern period. It lasts in Latin America, roughly through the end of the 18th century. Coronado is Machiavellian. Machiavello, have you ever heard his name? The one who wrote The Prince. Ooh, even if you never read that book, you know it's not a particularly nice book. You wouldn't read it to your grandchild unless you want a really weird grandchild. Because what Machiavello said, and God knows the conquistadors followed him for the letter of the law, was power is a means to an end and you do anything to keep in power, you know? And every empire, English or Spanish speaking, has followed that, that rule. So it's Coronado who will kick Cortes out of the northern expedition and send Cortes furiously back to Spain to claim his rights. But now it's Coronado's time, okay? Now the old conquistador is now considered over the hill. And Coronado will kind of shoot himself in the foot by constantly referring to himself as El Segundo Cortés, right? I'm the second Hernán Cortés. And the Cortés of Sonora, not quite, darling, not quite. So right before the expedition sets off in 1540, we have the reports of one of the most controversial of all Catholic priests, somebody who actually, some of his Franciscan colleagues actually asked that he be defrocked, which is quite serious. How many of you have ever heard the name Marcos de Niza? Okay, more, right? My friend and colleague Kendra pointed out to me that's the name of a high school. <laughs> Before he was a high school, <laughs> He was one of the most, um, I would say, hotly debated figures in the history of the Southwest. So Marcos de Niza was a Franciscan priest who, like many Franciscan <coughs> priests of the time, had a kind of messianic, or we could say millenarian, view. We were coming close to the end of days. For Marcos de Niza, evangelizing the native peoples was part of bringing the end of days closer. But Marcos de Niza was either hallucinating or lying directly. And there's a reason why he will be so disgraced. Um, 
and he actually will leave the Coronado expedition in the middle. So we call this slide Marcos Benita and his imaginary geography. Did he lie? Did he lie? Or was he using, do you remember Cabeta de Vaca? I'm throwing all these names at you, but you're following. Was he using? Cabeta de Vaca's crazy stories about the seven cities of Cibola as ammunition so that the Viceroy of Mexico would give him the economic backing, you know, for, for his project? Was he consciously lying? Was, as a very great historian in Yale University, Stuart Schwartz points out, was it simply so common in that time to mix fantasy and fact that there was no difference? Can we say it's only that time? We talk about weapons of mass destruction. Don't think you are superior to people in the early modern period or the medieval period. Don't think that. That's also a kind of fake idea from the 19th century. We're going towards progress. I don't know. <laughs> if we talk about imaginary political geographies, I kind of think the 19th and the 20th century um, would outdo anything we had, but maybe, well, in the, the 16th century runs a close second. Marcos de Niza had been in at what we now call Arizona and New Mexico, Sonora, let's just call it. That was what the Opata Indians call it. That's what the Spanish Empire will call it. That's what it will be called till in 1848, the United States. Uh, and Mexico fight a war, and this territory, which was Mexican, goes over to the United States. Sonora. What had Marcos de Niza seen? Well, in 1539, he came here with a very famous black explorer. Do you know that in Arizona and New Mexico, there was a very famous black explorer? Well, you also have not taught this. Somebody knows it. Who knows it? Yes. What was his name? God bless you. Esteban. Okay, so now you know. They actually, I have to tell you, the Southwest is one of the most fascinating multicultural histories on the planet. Um, so stop thinking there's no history in the Southwest, and please stop saying what I often hear Americans say, oh, we don't have the history that's thousands of years old. Yes, we do. Yes, we absolutely do. And when Europe is having its renaissance, we're having our very difficult colonial period. There is history here. Esteban was a slave who traveled with Cabeta de Vaca, but Esteban, before he was a slave, had actually been a doctor in North Africa. So he was known as a healer, and the native peoples believed that he had great powers. And Marcos de Niza met him, and he was very impressed with Esteban. He was so impressed with Esteban that Marcos de Niza brought him back to meet the Viceroy of Mexico and said to him, Antonio, if you let me go with Esteban, he'll take us to the seven cities of Simola. Okay, now what's interesting is, you know, where is this woman inventing this? I'm sure half of you are thinking, wow, she only really sounds interesting. Is she like writing all this when she's, after she's had too much tequila? No. All of this is preserved for you in what are called the archives of the nation in Mexico City. And if you want to cheat and read them in English with the Spanish translations right next to them, may I recommend a magnificent book to you called, what is it called? Documents of the Coronado Expedition. And the writers are Doctors Richard and Shirley Flint. And what they have done is literally synthesized for you in, place, in case you don't want to go plowing through all the colonial documents, which are wonderfully preserved in Mexico. Um, they have given you the Spanish with the English translations and they've synthesized the story for you. Um, so according to the documents to whoever the Viceroy had sitting next to him when he was talking to Marcos de Niza and Esteban, Esteban said nothing, but he smiled bitterly. Isn't that interesting? Okay, it's very interesting because it says in Spanish, amargamente. A sonreído. He has smiled bitterly. And you know, if you kind of put yourself in Esteban's skin, you can imagine why. He, he was a brilliant man. He was a doctor who had been enslaved. As a slave, he can't say, I know this person is inventing things. Because he could be killed if he says that. And he realizes, frankly, he's going to be sacrificed. Well, he was. Because Marcos de Niza, of course, made a point of sending Esteban into all, every Indian village that he visited first. Now, of course, the local Zuni and Pima and Hookam 
and Apache peoples. The Apaches had recently come into the area we now call Arizona. This is very interesting. At the end of the 15th century, so it kind of almost coincides with Spain's arrival in the New World. You have the arrival of the Apaches and the Navajos in the American Southwest coming down <coughs> from, anybody know? What is now Canada? Yes, very good, very good. We have some people who know there is great older American history. Our history does not begin in 1776. That's an important date, but there is a long history before that. So, those peoples, those who had been here for over 2,000 years, like the Hopi and the Hohokam and the Pima, those who had recently come, like the Navajo and the Apache, were really not thrilled at seeing what seemed to be a Spanish raiding and slaving party. They were already familiar with the conquistadors because they would come over the border. What border? Ah, there was a border. This area was northern Mexico and it was called La Gran Chichimeca, the great Chichimec area, because the ancestors of the Aztecs were called the Chichimecs. And there is a border, not between countries, but between provinces. So this area is its own province called New Galicia. And Esteban knows that the native peoples are not going to be thrilled to see them because they already know of the conquistadors as slavers. But let me tell you that the native peoples were not happy to see anybody come up from down south, including the Nahuatl-speaking Aztecs, because before the Spanish Empire had enslaved them, the Aztecs would come up on slave raids as well. Now, how do we know that? We know that through archaeological evidence, and more than anything, we know it through the stories and the oral tradition of the Navajo people who had constant and very, very difficult contact with Aztec slave raiding parties. And we know it from a magnificent Aztec rune, which unfortunately has fallen into runes called Chichilticale, which is right in the center of, uh, of Arizona, literally 60 miles to the east of Tucson. See all the things you have here in Arizona that you didn't know about? Denitha sends Esteban into these areas with the soldiers, and Esteban and the soldiers are obviously not welcomed, and there is a clash, and Esteban is killed in a clash with Zuni Indians. Marcos Denitha, what does he do? He turns tail and flees. And he goes back, but he goes back lying. And I want to read to you what he says when he goes back, because it's what he says now that actually gets Coronado's expedition some financing. Two chiefs, this is Marcos Denitha's testimony, Two chiefs said that they would go with me. With these and my own Indian interpreters, I pursued my journey until, until within sight of Cibola, okay, now he's saying he's seen one of the seven golden cities, which is situated in a plain at the base of a round hill. I saw that it has the appearance of a very beautiful city, the best that I have seen in these parts. The houses are of the style the Indians had described to me, all made of stone. Okay, you know he's lying now. <laughs> because the stone was where? It was in Tenochtitlan. This is the way the Mexica, this is the way the Aztecs built. The Pueblo, of course, built their homes of what? Adobe. Okay, but what, what does he want to do? He has to convince them this is going to be a second conquest of Mexico. Right? This is going to be Tenochtitlan part two. Okay, um, with their stories and terraces. And it appeared to me from a hill where I was able to view it. Okay, now comes the biggest lie. Listen, the city is larger than Tenochtitlan. Ooh! You know, Cortes gave the amount of um, inhabitants of Tenochtitlan in his letters of relation. He claimed that there were over 100,000 people in Tenochtitlan and that it was larger than any city he knew of from Spain. So now Marcos Denita is saying that Acoma Pueblo, because that's what he's talking about, is bigger than Tenochtitlan, no? And Acoma Pueblo still exists, and it was never bigger than Tenochtitlan. 
which is now the city of Mexico. At times I was tempted to go to it because I knew that I risked only, only my life, which I had offered to God on the day I began this journey. But finally I realized, considering my danger, and that if I died, I would not be able to make my report of this to this country. Isn't that nice the way he says, that's the way I sent Esteban? And a bunch of poor Spanish soldiers in, but of course I, Antonio, had to come back to you. Which to me appears the greatest and best of the discoveries. It is greater than Cortez's conquest of Tenochtitlan. Uh -huh. It is greater than Pizarro's con conquest of Peru. Mm. <laughs> Listen. I made a great heap of stones, and on top of it I placed a cross, small and light only because I had not the means of making it larger. And I declared that I erected that cross and monument to the name of Don Antonio de Mendoza. Guys, that's the one he's making the report to. Right? Viceroy of New Spain for the Emperor Charles V, Carlos V, as a sign of possession, I have planted the flag. Was this a lie? No, the whole thing. <laughs> but take a look at that picture you have an artist's rendering of what the actual Zuni Pueblos that they encountered would have looked more like and as you know of course the Pueblo Indians built and they build their houses up on the hills what was the original reason for defense Okay, just like Europeans had their wars, native people have always had their wars. So we've seen one aspect of Denitha's character. Let me tell you, we'll see the same aspect again when in the midst of a huge battle between Coronado and the Zuni Indians in the place that Denitha swore was Cibola. After the battle, Coronado himself says to Denitha, Have you lied? <laughs> and Denitha the next day ran back to Mexico City. So he did not stand by his words. If you want to know what happened to him eventually, he was never tried or put on trial as you're going to see Coronado will be, um, but he basically dies disgraced and basically abandoned by most of his Franciscan brothers. Where are all the women? This is a real guy story, eh? Yeah, this is a bunch of men in a locker room. Isn't that what empire is? And when the British will send the Puritans to the northeast coast and do there what Cortes did in Tenochtitlan, it's a guy's story. Well, no. There are women, and let's restore some of the women to their rightful place. One of them has been considered very notorious. She's always blamed with having caused the fall of the Aztec Empire. As though this very frightened but brilliant 15 or 16 year old girl could have caused that. You know of her name as Malinche. That's the young woman Cortes will appropriate, probably rape, forced to be his lover, and use as his translator because she was a very brilliant young woman. She was of Mexica origin, although nowadays some people in Mexico think she may have been Mayan. And you know, in history, she has been vilified with causing the downfall of the empire. So we have a woman there every time we want to blame her. Narratives of conquest are usually guy narratives, aren't they? Okay, where are women during this time? Well, I'd like you to meet an incredibly, incredibly courageous woman who started what I am going to call anachronistically, but I'm going to call it one of the first campaigns for human rights, right where you're standing, right in Arizona, right in the place that I just called for you, Chichilticale that Nahua Aztec name that was put on this old rune, 60 miles to the north of Tucson. Her name is Fra Francisca de Ofis. Her husband, God bless him, very, very far-seeing man, I would say, well, far ahead of his time for the 16th century, maybe also for the 21st. Alonso Sanchez, who supported his wife, very strong woman, and defended her against the conquistador, who you can imagine wanted to rip her throat out. Who were Francisca and Alonso? Francisca was a businesswoman. Does that surprise you to know that women did not stay at home? People, the only women who stayed at home in the 16th century were maybe 0.001% of the population, but very wealthy. Most women were working. They were farm women or they were working in small trade. And Francisca sold scrap metal. 
That's what she did. She had a ferreteria, as we say in Spanish. She had a scrap metal store. And she was married to Alonso <coughs> Sanchez, who was a shoemaker. These were humble people. They'd come from Spain looking for a better life. They had joined Coronado's expedition, believing that it would lead to a better life. And from the beginning, Coronado regretted desperately having taken this, what did he call her, a harpy, an arpia, right? Any strong woman who speaks her mind as a harpy, he really regretted taking Francisca de Ozmas with him. He even more regretted taking her husband, who Coronado said had the temerity to defend his wife's nonsense. God bless the two of you. Why do we like them? Because these very humble people are the first who dare to challenge the conquistador and his soldiers Get ready for mistreatment of the native people. Now, this is a very, very important moment. So let's undo this idea of, oh yeah, Arizona kind of gets into the history books because Cor Coronado was a failed Cortez and the expedition here was, you know, diddly winks and... No, this is one of the most important moments I'm going to tell you in the history of the New World. Many Spaniards were utterly disgusted by what the conquistadors were doing, and they had no idea what they were doing until they came to the New World and saw it. So, although they were tempted by the stories of easy gold, who wouldn't be when they were back in Spain, don't forget most people in Spain were also starving to death. Because the king of Spain at the time, Carlos V, really didn't care about the people of Spain, he just cared about financing his wars in Flanders, where he was originally from. So they thought, okay, let's go to the New World, we'll find gold. And that is what Francisca thought, and that is what Alonso thought, but they were both disgusted by Coronado. And they start to challenge him openly. How do we know this? Because Coronado had a very important scribe with him writing everything down. And now this is where you're going to see, we saw, we, we have Cortez's ghosts all over the place here. Right? This was supposed to be Cortez's expedition, and he was shut out at the last minute. Now we have the ghost of the woman that Cortez kidnapped, raped, fell in love with, threw away, and then came back on his bended knees when, thank God, she threw him away. Malinche, right? Or Se Malinavi, as her name was in the Aztec language in Nahua. Her nephew, Juan de Jaramillo, was Coronado's scribe. Okay, are you seeing? This is really an, a concerted attempt to make this the conquest of Mexico part two. <clears throat> so Juan de Jaramillo, Malinche's nephew, is writing everything down. And we can only imagine, my God, what would he have felt, you know, being the nephew of Malinche? He must have felt rather ambivalent about this, you know, watching Coronado treat the Indians as badly as Cortez had. But now he, Juan de Jaramillo, was also part of the conquistador's party. And yet he himself must have felt very conflicted due to his background. So I want you to see, we have a lot of shades of gray here, okay? The first time I remember sitting with people in transborder studies, we spoke about this actually with a collaborator of, of uh, a friend and collaborator of my director, uh, Bob Bjork, your friend Ed Escobar, and Ed had said to me, you know, borders are changeable things. They have holes in them, they're porous. I want you to see identities also are. Okay? Identities are very porous things. But for Francisca, she only knows one thing. She might not have known the justification of the conquest or cared, but she saw Coronado acting brutal towards native people, and she, as a Spanish woman, saw no need for this. And she dared to challenge him. I want you to imagine this, because this is an extraordinary scene. It happens in Chichilticale, again, here in Arizona, people, go look for it, the rune is there. Chichilticale in Nahua means the red house. And Juan de Jaramillo, Malinche's nephew, called it that when they came. They saw what had looked like a large, yes, very Aztec-looking fortress. And they saw that the native peoples used it as a place to trade, but they couldn't quite figure out who had built it because they saw it wasn't built the way the Pueblos were built. Could it have been built by the Aztecs? 
Was Juan de Jaramillo just saying that because everybody knows he was Malinche's nephew? Malinche's nephew? And that made this appear more like the conquest of Mexico? Well, it was at Chichilticale that, for the first time, Francisca de Otis literally screams at Coronel and calls him un animal. You have no right to treat these people this way. I find her testimony incredibly moving when you read the documents of the Coronado Expedition by the Doctors Flint, I think you will too, because unlike many other early champions of human rights in the New World, have any of you heard of Las Casas, right? The priest Las Casas, or Antonio de Montesinos, this woman is not a learned woman, okay? She does not have a background in Aristotle and Plato the way Las Casas did. She just knows she's seeing something wrong. Her husband doesn't quite know what he's seeing, but he shields her when Coronado steps forward to smack her. And I see something tremendously moving in that, because Coronado was of noble birth and Alonso was not. You didn't challenge a nobleman, but this is a new world. So I would tell you that there's something really interesting about Arizona's history. Because instead of saying, oh, this is where the conquest of Mexico went wrong, let's say maybe this is where human rights goes right. Because Francisca de Ortiz and her husband, Alonso Sanchez, and now one very young 19-year-old boy named Juan de Jaramillo, Juan who was basically Coronado's personal page, he joins the couple in saying to Coronado, what you're doing is wrong. Maybe they all thought the conquista was right. People in the age of empire, the 16th century is the age of empire par excellence. I don't think anybody doubted that you had a right to conquer people. God knows the Aztecs thought that too. But they do see something very wrong with the way it's being done. Such as when Coronado decided to hang, burn, draw, and quarter the remains of eight Opata Indians who had protested against their food being stolen by a member of his party. So this young, illiterate page, Juan de Contreras, now becomes the third person to literally stand up to Coronado and say, it's wrong. You don't have to do it this way. Now you can ask a question, what would be the obvious question? Why doesn't Coronado kill these people? Right? You would imagine. Well, Coronado is a little bit worried now because, remember, the goal is to get back to Tenochtitlan, then called the city of Mexico, and make a report. People are going to ask what happened. Somebody's going to talk. So he can't kill them because word might get out, but he cannot silence them either. Okay, and he constantly refers to, Coronado says, in many of these documents, why didn't I listen, por que no escuché a los marineros? Why didn't I listen to the sailors? Que dicen que traer a una mujer a bordo es mala suerte, right? <laughs> Bringing a woman on board is bad luck. <laughs> That's your problem, Francisco. Francisca really is an extraordinary character. So are the men who supported her. But this wonderful challenge to conquest happens in Arizona. She should be proud of the fact that in Arizona, the conquistador myth is totally unraveled. Okay, Coronado is not Cortes and Pizarro. He can't find any gold. His second in command, Garcia Lopez de Cárdenas, actually becomes the first Spaniard to lay his eyes on Oh, it's a pretty good tourist attraction in the state. Yeah. La Canyon Grande, he calls it, the Grand Canyon. And the first, and this is wild, folks, the first description of the Grand Canyon written down, because of course the native peoples had many wonderful oral traditions where they described it, but the first time it is written in the Western tradition, it is in Spanish, and the one who writes it is Juan de Jaramillo, that's Malinche's nephew. I think this is a kind of extraordinary history Arizona should know about, no? Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of amazing and tragic that you don't, but now you do. Look at these next names. El Turco and Bigotes. Who knows some Spanish? What does Bigotes mean? <coughs> Mustaches, right? What does El Turco mean? Come on, that's easy. 
the Turk. El Turco was a name that they, that Coronado and his followers gave to a native Pawnee warrior who was the slave of Bigotes, who was of the Zuni people, we think. He may have been Zuni, he may have belonged to another ethnicity. Okay, now this may be surprising you or maybe not. Did the native peoples also have slaves? Yes. Slavery is a human ill. Okay? The great American abolitionist John Brown said slavery is like leprosy. It is universal and it has gone through all peoples. That was John Brown's answer when people would say to the abolitionists, oh, there's always been slavery. So, yeah, there's always been leprosy. So what? Okay, so we see now that the native societies were also stratified in terms of class. El Turco is the slave of bigotes. Now, El Turco is from the area we now call Kansas. <laughs> bigotes is from what we now call the border, right? those trans borders, those borders that move back and forth, the current border between New Mexico and Arizona. And El Turco wanted to get back to Kansas. So he did what any white, black, or green slave would have done. He told the conquistador stories about this other amazing golden city, because by now, you know, Cibola is not materializing. And this second place is called Kivira, and it's all the way over there. When Coronado got impatient that the party that had split off to find Kibera in Kansas could, couldn't find it, he decided to torture Bigotes, who was the owner of El Turco. And now he's going to really get himself into trouble. He does torture and kill Bigotes. He sets his dogs on him. The conquistadors had a very cruel method, which I have to tell you was used by the Puritans in New England later on. A rather large dog called an Allen dog, Los Alamos, as they were known in Spanish, um, which would be like a Rottweiler gone mad, and it would literally tear your flesh off. Now, when Coronado did this to Bigotes, he knows he doesn't. Who, who does he not want seeing this? Francisca de Otis, right? Because she's got a mouth. So he has the execution far away from the camp. Guess who sneaks out and sees it? Okay, and it's going to be her testimony because she watches this and she is appalled. This is what is going to spur Francisca de Ofes to initiate the court case against Corona. Do you know that this incredibly courageous woman brings the first case against the conquistador to Spanish courts based on mistreatment of the Indians? So you're talking about a kind of extraordinary person. Isn't it amazing the way women always get written out of history? How many of you are old enough to remember the talking heads? Where I wrote to nowhere. That should have been the theme song for Francisco de Coronado because he did not know where he was going. He only knew he was not finding Tenochtitlan. He wasn't finding Cortez's Tenochtitlan. He was not finding the great city of gold in the Andes. He wasn't finding Pizarro's Cuzco. He was finding nothing. Kendra and I were fiddling around with the PowerPoint and she's showing me all these amazing images. We see this one in Kansas. I told Kendra, we need Kansas. And of course, remember the Wizard of Oz? We all know that. We're in Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. No, because Kansas turned out not to have Kivira. It turned out to have no gold, no silver, no nothing. No precious metals were found. You realize that if Coronado had found gold or silver, all of this, he could have justified this politically. Gracias a Dios, que no he encontrado nada. What did I just say in Spanish? Thank God he found nothing. And Francisco de Ofes was thanking God that he found nothing. So the party that goes all the way east to Kansas finds nothing. And we know that Francisca de Ofes the whole way back taunts Coronado by calling him mockingly Capitan Cortez. <laughs> yeah, she was being catty, God bless her. So we say instead of Mexico, Coronado got Peru, but without the gold. What does that mean? 
The Aztecs fell relatively quickly in Mexico. After three years, Cortes conquered them. You know that didn't happen in Peru. And in Peru, the fighting would last for over 250 years. Now, there will be other native uprisings in Mexico, and the Mayan Indians will fight ooh, through the 20th century. And later on, there will be other Nahua uprisings. But there was something about Cortes and the way he came down like a wolf on the fold. I just used an Old Testament quote that describes the Assyrians destroying Jerusalem. Um, he was scary. I'm not surprised people fell before him. Coronado thought that would happen, but you know, things just didn't frighten people anymore. No, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> At this point, the Indians knew very well the horse was just an animal. And oh, there was a group of native peoples from Arizona who Coronado was scared. He says, cabalgan mejor que nosotros. They ride better than we do. Who are they? The Apache. So the Apache saw the horses, saw the guns, whoop, got them. And the Southwest became the same chaos that Peru became, which in terms of the development of human rights was not such a bad thing. Sonora. So for Spanish speakers, people, Arizona is Sonora. Okay, and for English speakers, it's Arizona, and they're both part of your heritage, and they are both part of the same reality. When Coronado goes skulking back, to Mexico City with, listen closely, three-fourths of his party dead. Okay? Seventy-five of the close to 400 soldiers who'd followed him returned. I forgot to mention to you that he had over a thousand Tlaxcalan Indians on this expedition many of whom will stay in the Southwest. And did you know that the oldest continuously inhabited house in the continental United States is in the beautiful city of Santa Fe in New Mexico? It's called the Tlaxcalan House. And it is right next to a pizza parlor. <laughs> now you know about the house. That house was built by Tlaxcalan Indians uh, who came here from Mexico in the 16th century. That is the oldest continuously inhabited house in the continental United States. So again, people, this is part of your history. If you're American, I don't care whether you're English speaking, Spanish speaking, Irish Gaelic speaking, this is part of your history. And I think we do such a disservice to ourselves when we often say as Americans, we don't have an ancient history. We certainly do. And part of this history is the shame of Coronado. And Coronado goes skulking back, but you know who's going back now? You see, he made a really fatal error. We know Francisca de Ortiz hated his guts. We know that her husband hated him, and Juan de Contreras hated him, and a lot of the Tlaxcalan Indians, who had been Cortez's allies in the conquest of Mexico, hated him. And they wanted to stay in this area. Folks, they wanted to stay in Arizona. It was in this area. Chichilticale, again, 60 miles to the northeast of Tucson, that they really wanted to stay. And he refused to let them. That was his error. I mean, he was afraid, we know from the documents, he was afraid they would cause a revolt. Well, the revolt would come when they all got back to Mexico City, because that's something really unheard of happens. A woman initiates a legal court case. God bless you, Francisca. The first legal court case. Not against the conquistador. We know that Cortes had many legal cases against him. But that was for simply not um, distributing the gold and the booty among his men as he promised. This is the first legal case initiated against the conquistador for mistreatment of Indians. And it's done by a woman. Again. Not only have you had half of your history written out of your Arizona textbooks, but as a woman, I have to tell you, once again, we get our worst done. <laughs> now, let's not be overly optimistic here, folks. Francisca and her male allies, because her, again, this wonderful husband she had, who supports her all the way, the young page, Juan de, um, 
Juan de Contreras, and over, we know at least 25, and then we have some other kind of anonymous testimonies, but at least 25 other people on the expedition um, condemn Coronado for extreme cruelty. It did not result in Coronado being convicted. Look at the third point. We have a weak colonial judiciary and a very strong woman, and some very good men who supported her. But Francisca had a victory, because after that trial, Coronado was publicly shamed. And he could not get a good job, and he was not called on for anything important, and he was ridiculed, and he will die later before the age of 50 in obscurity. And there's a story, and it's just a story, but it's included in most of the books um, of the documents, that because both Francisca and her, her husband and Coronado and his wife, Beatriz de la Estrada, whose money he had completely squandered on this expedition, then now they were all in a kind of semi-state of poverty, although Francisca a bit worse than Coronado. Anytime she would run into him on the street, she would of course salute him with what name? <laughs> Buenos dias, Capitan Cortes. Even if that's not true, I think he completely knew he was a failure. Her victory was his public shaming. What are the implications for the hemisphere? I really wish they would teach this in Arizona public schools. Yeah, the idea of human rights. Let's look at the implications now back in Arizona. So the Yaqui, the Raramuri, and the Opata peoples regroup. And the King's Road, have you ever heard of the phrase El Camino Real? Well, this, you know, of course, goes right through Arizona. Now, old extensions of it, unofficial extensions of it, went through where we're standing now, which is Tempe, which was San Pedro, which was Sonota, which was God knows what before the Opata showed up, because there were other native cultures older than they were, and older than the Pima. This area has Makoa feathers when you go digging, it has chocolate, it has obsidian, which you know was a sacred stone for, for the Aztecs and for many other native peoples, and it has objects including copper bells, you know, that came up from very far down south in Central America. And the King's Road would literally go from South America from the areas Pizarro had conquered in Peru, up to Montana, in fact. One wonderful thing I found out talking with our friends in the School of Transborder Studies, you see, because ACMRS and Transborder talk. You've heard of interdisciplinary collaboration. We may be two of the only places actually doing it. Um, and so my friend Teresa Avila there in the back had showed me something very interesting from a performance artist who was marking roots of the conquistadors, and some of them went as far north as Idaho. Okay, so there is this amazing history here in the Southwest that forms part of the continuum of our American history. Well, what we now call the American Southwest, or Northern Mexico, is incorporated into the Spanish Empire, and the new name for it will be Nueva Galicia. California, and these other names that you know better. Sonora, San Pedro, Tempe. What's it going to be tomorrow? Okay, so there was a time when this history was a little better known. And if you're looking at that lovely image that Kendra found for us of the telescope looking at a map, again, you know, maps. Amazing maps. You saw some of the wonderful maps from the collection, uh, from Transborder's collection. Maps connect with our imagination. We have Spanish imaginations, we have Anglo-Saxon imaginations, we have black imaginations, white imaginations, all religions, Native American imaginations, and the Hopi imagination is not the Apache imagination. They are also different imaginations, and the way we understand our geography is different. So whatever you want to call the place, please know that it has always had another name. And living here, this is also part of the richness of the area. American historians in the 19th century did not have an allergy to this, you know. Um, very famous historian by the name of William Henry Prescott, who wrote the History of the Conquest of Mexico and History of the Conquest of Peru. He himself was also quite fascinated 
<clears throat> by the history of the American Southwest, what became the American Southwest after 1848. Um, and he viewed this as an integral part of understanding the hemisphere, so why do we only start history in the 19th century? It is so much older, it is so much richer. Tempe's multicultural past and present, because you know, Tempe was hysterically multicultural, we see all these cultures here, and you know it is one of the most multicultural places in the United States? Thanks to that wonderful employer of both ACMRS and SDS, what is that called? You. <laughs> All right, but it does make for a very multicultural area. So we talk about understanding different historical narratives, understanding those different historical narratives, and understanding how those narratives connect—not how they don't connect, but how they do connect. We want to thank you very, very much for being here. We want to thank you for your support. We hope that you will support us for all future events. And thank you to the museum for giving us this wonderful space. We hope this is the first of a series of events that ACMRS, the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies, will do with STS, the School for Transborder Studies. We want to thank Professor Robert Bjork, the director of ACMRS makes this possible, whose global vision of ACMRS allows the Middle Ages and the Renaissance to include Europe, but not to only be Europe, to connect with Europe with the rest of the world. And as Bob mentioned to you at the beginning, you know, ACMRS had a program on medieval America. Well, I certainly hope nobody will ever walk out thinking that the United States does not have a medieval or Renaissance past. It certainly does. We want to thank you very much for your support, and we want to call your attention also to our table at the back where you will see material from ACMRS, including a wonderful series on historical fiction called Bagwin Books. We hope that you will take some wonderful flyers from that. Um, you'll also see material from the School of Transporter Studies, and now that we still have some time, I'd like to possibly, can we raise the lights and ask for questions? Thank you very much.